morning, everybody. Welcome to CRA 2017 in beautiful San Diego. All right. We are thrilled to have you all here. This is a good looking crowd, and I don't say that just because the lights are in my eyes and I can't see you. Um, you know, a lot has changed since we were together uh, in Sacramento a year ago. Uh, some for the good. We passed a single use plastic bag ban statewide. And that's, that's awesome, not just for the thing that we accomplished with that, that we've all been working on at the local level for years, um, but because of the symbolism of it. I think the state legislature and the local elected officials around the state saw that there's support for these sorts of actions that we wanna take uh, for the benefit of the environment. Um, the same day we learned about that, we learned who our new president would be. And over the following months, we learned who the leadership team would be and frankly, that presents some challenges for us. These are folks that want to pull us out of climate accords, want to roll back environmental regulations, and um, that, that creates challenges for the work that we all want to do. Luckily, at the state and local level around the country, folks have said, you know, if the federal government's going to take a step back, we're going to double down. And you've seen that. You've seen that at your local level, you've seen that at the state. We extended uh, cap and trade for climate for another 10 years at the state level, which is awesome. So we need to, we need to continue the march. Um, we've got other challenges. Uh, we learned earlier this year that China is gonna stop taking our dirty plastics and paper. And we've all got a responsibility to respond to that. Um, we got lazy and fat over the last 10 years or so. And we were sending our garbage around the world and polluting other people's environments. And I know that's not what we all intended to do when we started this movement and when we've promoted these programs. And so we've got an obligation to respond there. Probably the most important change to the people in this room, in September, just after our last conference, the governor signed SB 1383. And we've now got real policy in California with real teeth to move organics out of landfill. And that's something that we've been asking for from the, uh, the podium at CRRA, from the technical councils, from the NICRA players skits for over a decade. We want to get those organics out and we want to move them into the productive economy. And now we've got to do it. And it's a big lift. 20 plus million tons. And I'll, uh, I'll take Matt Cotton's words from one of the early, uh, early workshops on this. You know, we could either whine and complain about how we can't do it, or we could step up and do it. And that's what I'm calling all of you to do today. You know, uh, we have a serious, serious lack of leadership in our society, in our government. And um, I, I think we all need to step up as leaders and I'd, I'd call on all of you to do that. Um, a great American general defined leadership as the art of accomplishing what the science of management says is impossible. And there were people in the Cal Recycle workshops that were saying, this is impossible. We can't get to this number. So I think it's going to take leadership. And I think we can all exhibit that leadership. It takes vision and heart and persistence. It means that we've got to do the things every day that we want others to do so that we can model that. Um, it means that rather than building walls, we've got to tear them down. And we've got to build bridges to other parts of the environmental community. When uh, Tom Steyer closed our conference last year, he called on all of us to work across the silos in the environmental movement, to work with the water folks and the air folks and the marine litter folks and the stormwater folks to figure out how do we build real, viable, sustainable solutions. Um, we don't want to build compost facilities and MRFs that pollute the air and pollute the water. That's not our goal. That won't be sustainable. We need to work with those folks. It's harder, but we need to do it. The good news with leadership is everybody can do it. Whether you're in the industry in your first year as a recycling coordinator, you're the CEO of your company, you can lead from your station. And we've all got a responsibility if we're gonna hit these goals. So um, I'd call on all of you to step up to the challenge. For those of you that are in market development and marketing the materials, um, I'd ask you to lead. You're building the economy that the you're building the markets that the circular economy that we want is founded on. Uh, lead your suppliers to produce the quality that makes those markets sustainable. For the material processors and composters, 
Keep adapting and innovating. Keep expanding the infrastructure and improving quality. Lead us in a race to the top rather than getting lazy and undercutting your competition with a race to the bottom. For the haulers, lead the industry. Show that you do more than just move the material from the customer to the facility. You, you are where the rubber hits the road, quite literally, in zero waste. And if your companies can do more and better to achieve zero waste for the communities and customers that you serve, I promise you, your market share will expand, your bottom line will increase. There's big opportunity there if you do this the right way. For the many of you in this room that are in local government, uh, show your peers in California and around the world that your community is going to be a leader, no matter how small or large that you are. You really have a hard job. You have to hold the entire system that you oversee accountable. And it starts with the markets. And I think local governments have uh, privatized that responsibility over the years. But you have a responsibility to sustainable markets. You have a responsibility to oversee what your processors and your haulers and your generators are doing. And under the new 1383 regulations, you may have to enforce against those folks. For the recycling coordinators and the outreach folks in the room that uh, work on behavior change, you probably have the hardest job of all. You're on the front lines every day trying to interact with the public to change behavior. And you're fighting against a uh, lot of advertising in a global economy that's built around convenience and planned obsolescence. What you're doing is hard. But if you're persistent, if you lead every day in every interaction that you have, if you meet those people that you're trying to change where they are and you exchange value in meaningful terms to them, they'll follow your lead. They'll come around. For the Game of Thrones fans in the room, I'll say winter is coming. <laughs> we have a lot of external threats that are facing us, folks. And if we fight amongst our kingdoms here in, in this room, we're going to lose. We really are. Um, let's, not be the, let's not be the folks that fought for the policy, that sang the songs at the Nick Player Show, and then fight the new compost facility. Fight the new MRF. We all come to CRA to get inspired, to work together, to make this vision a reality by working together. Um, so this week, talk to the other leaders. See how they're overcoming the challenges that you're facing. Get inspired by them. Get motivated by them. Uh, make the connections that build those coalitions and those synergies that drive us towards the goals. We're really stronger together. Um, CRA's board, and, and I'll thank Colleen Foster for her vision and her leadership on this, uh, really believe that that was the effective strategy as we took on our project to start a new Zero Waste Principles and Practices certification course. I'll tell you, it would have been a lot easier to do it just talking to the 500 of you in this room. Um, we could have built it faster, we could have built it cheaper, and it would have probably been a little bit more pure CRRA. But that wasn't our vision. Um, with Colleen's support and a lot of the members in this room that are SWANA members and CRRA members, we got encouragement to work together, and now we have the opportunity not just to talk to each other, but to change about 10,000 solid waste professionals across the U.S. and Canada. That's power. That's more than we can do in this room. So this week, we've got 24 students in the first uh, publicly available class. Um, it was an excited group as it launched yesterday morning. I think they're here today in this room. Um, and we wish them all luck. We know that this certification course empowers them to be more effective in their jobs. We know it provides value to their employers. And we hope that as we roll this ar out around the rest of California and the rest of the US and Canada, that more and more people see that the right path is a circular economy and zero waste and not the linear path of integrated solid waste management. Speaking of leadership, CRA has a new executive director. Um, the board voted unanimously to hire our new executive director and to support her. Uh, I will uh, say that we did better than the Electoral College did. Um, our leader has vision and drive. She's constructive. Um, she really has the energy and, and the passion to move us forward to meet the challenges and to help all of you meet the challenges that are in front of us with the policy goals that we have. So on behalf of the entire CRRA board, uh, I am so thrilled to introduce all of you to our new executive director, Jenna Abbott.
Thank you very much, Rob. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here, and I am excited to be taking the helm of the CRRA at such a pivotal time in our history. Over the last few weeks, I've been on the job three weeks. Please, <laughs> please don't ask me anything too difficult for the next couple of days. But as I have spoken to our members by telephone, and as I have spoken to our sponsors in person, and by telephone, and as I have spoken to you, our conference attendees, I have been blown away by the passion that we all have to pursue this mission for zero waste. I have also been really amazed by how many of you started in environmental work at the tender age of five or six. How many of you have been doing it your entire lives? This is a passion that we have and we share. And for someone like me, it's super exciting to look out and see a room full of people who are mission aligned. I don't know whether you understand how uncommon that is. So look around you and see the army that you have to advance this mission. It's truly exciting. The next three to five years, however, are going to be pivotal in our industry, and in order to meet our goals, we're going to have to find allies. We're also going to have to find other means of support. Rob mentioned a or SB 1383. That presents us with the opportunity, the support network, and an enforcement structure to advance our mission, because it talks about the diversion of organics from landfill, and that's something that this group has been working on for a while. So it's nice to see that coming to fruition. It also sets up opportunities for us to form strategic alliances and build partnerships. While the genesis of the quote is unclear, I have heard it said that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, travel together. I think that there will be times when we will need to go alone because we see an opportunity and we have to move towards that opportunity quickly. But I also think that there will be many more times when we will need to go far which means we're going to have to go together. So when we at the CRRA come to you looking for travel partners, I hope that you will grab your passport and come along. In addition, I hope that if you are not currently a member of the CRRA or a sponsor of the CRRA, that you will consider doing so. We need to work together and present a united front. The work that we're facing right now is difficult, but it's not impossible. It's a lot easier when we have many hands to do it. Your membership or your sponsorship is your anti-in. And I'm asking you today from this podium and on behalf of the board of directors that if you are not already a member of this great association, please come and see me and we can fix that right away. We're gonna need a solid voice for those who are in favor of the mission to be able to hear us and support us. And we're also going to need a solid voice to be able to have those who seek to derail us hear us. Together is where it's at. And we may not always agree on the nuances, but we are mission aligned and we are rowing in the same direction. So we need to find ways to find the common ground and move together. And now I'd just like us to take a moment and acknowledge this beautiful venue that we are in. This place is amazing. Those of you who came to the welcome reception last night, and thank you, Colleen, for making me revisit my days of big hair. I sure appreciated that. Those of you who came last night saw that beautiful sunset over the terrace. And I think about people who live here in San Diego, such as our welcome speaker, and how lucky they are to see that view every day. Alejandra Gavaldon serves as the Director of Infrastructure and Water Policy for Mayor Faulkner. She has 13 years of experience working in government, public service, and binational relations. Throughout her career with the City of San Diego, Alejandra has served four mayoral administrations in the area of policy, binational border, government relations, and protocol. She is a dedicated and committed public servant. She began her career in the City of San Diego in 1999 as a protocol officer. She was born and raised in both Tijuana at San Diego and is fluent in Spanish and in English. She graduated from the University of California, San Diego. Of course she did. 
1995 with a BA in political science with an emphasis on international relations. If I could please ask you to join me at the stage, Alejandra. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Jenna, for that warm introduction and congratulations as new executive director. Um, I know everybody is very fortunate to have you at the helm and we specifically in the city of San Diego, our city team and mayor look forward to working with you and your entire organization. On behalf of Mayor Kevin Faulkner, I really welcome all of you to San Diego. Um, we're really excited that CRA selected San Diego to host your 41st annual trade show and conference. I don't know how many of you have already been to San Diego in the past. Um, if you've already visited us, welcome back. And for those of you who have the opportunity to have this be your first visit, you really are in for a treat. We're excited to have you here in San Diego, not just because we know that you're really going to enjoy what San Diego has to offer, our beautiful sights, the sunset, really an environment that we do not take for granted. Um, you'll be able to really enjoy, I think, the welcoming spirit of our community and San Diegans. But also, and most importantly, we're excited that you're here because you're going to be talking about themes and issues um, that are important to all of us. Zero waste, stormwater, our well-being, protecting our water, marine environment. All of these are issues, as stated, they're important worldwide, they're important to our state of California, but I can't emphasize enough how important it is to our city of San Diego and how dedicated we are to protecting those. Through Mayor Faulkner's leadership on environmental sustainability, as well as the commitment, the partnership and innovation of all of our city workforce, all of our departments, and San Diegans, because it really requires everybody to believe in this and pitch in, we are making progress in these areas. And in some of these areas, I will even say that we're being leaders. Uh, one thing that I do wanna emphasize because it was mentioned earlier about the importance of collaboration and really kind of working beyond just a specific issue. I do wanna say that, um, as mentioned, I've been with the city for, <clears throat> for quite a few years, gone through many administrations. And I can honestly say that we are in an era where we're seeing our entire city and our departments really talking and, and collaborating in a way that we haven't seen before. So when you look at our water and wastewater department, our stormwater, environmental services, uh, development services, the permitting, our economic development department, all of them are talking and working together because we know that all of the policies in one area will impact or benefit the other ones and we really need to look at things comprehensively. We're also able to make progress as a city and as a state because of the partnership that we have and the ability to learn from the expertise and experiences of others. And this is where we are really gr grateful and thankful for CRA because through organizing these conferences, um, we're able to really benefit from all of your expertise. Also, all of the training and educational offers, offerings that you offer um, are beneficial to all of us and I know for a lot of our City of San Diego employees. Um, I just want to mention uh, quickly, I want to uh, thank our sponsors for making this event possible and also for making it a success. Um, the City of San Diego is a sponsor, County of San Diego and the International Airport. I'm not going to go into great depth as far as all of the issues um, and programs that we're working on as a city. I think I will emphasize that as we all know, we're, fo we're faced with climate and environmental changes and challenges that affect all of us. It is our responsibility to ensure a clean, sustainable San Diego, a sustainable California for generations to come. And as mentioned, this requires collaboration, commitment, innovation, partnership, and continued dialogue. San Diegans from different backgrounds are coming together with our mayor, Mayor Kevin Faulkner, to protect and address environmental concerns. We're doing this also to strengthen our economy and to improve the quality of life. We're doing this to implement our climate action plan. And I also want to emphasize that here in San Diego, we are committed to our climate action plan and moving that forward uh, together with all of you and sometimes alone if we have to. Zero waste is a key component of our cap plans goals. Um, you're probably familiar with our zero waste goals. By 2020, divert 75% of trash collected in the city 
capture 80 percent of methane gas. Those goals increased by 2035, and with the goal of tw by 2040, eliminating 100 percent of waste of trash collected, diverting it from the landfills. And we know that it's not going to be easy, but it's going to take steady hand, continued cooperation, and being innovative in ways to hit that, but we're committed to that. And also, um, organics and food waste was mentioned, and that's an also an area, I think, of great opportunity that, it, you know, we're in it right now to work with the haulers, to work with, you know, our innovative economy, what that means for San Diego and what we can do to advance that. So we are doing our part. Um, and contributing to making California a leader in zero waste. We're also grateful to CRA and SWANA for their work on the zero waste principles and practices certification program, so thank you for that. As you can see, we are reducing, reusing, and recycling, and we are also doing that in our water area. You may have heard of our innovative pure water program. In essence, that will produce one-third of our water supply in San Diego by 2035. We are treating our wastewater, completing that natural cycle to safe, sustainable, drought-proof water supply. By doing that, it also have the benefit of diverting some of that discharge from going into our ocean environment, an ocean environment that we protect and that we always make sure through our ocean monitoring that we're not adversely impacting it. And we're also producing energy through biosolids. I want to highlight that Pure Water, such as other programs, but specifically this one, has the strong support of politicians, our environmental partners, our business community, and our community at large. It's taken a long time, but I think it serves as a great example of a way where we can move something that's integrated, it makes sense, it has a strong support of everybody, and it's in the benefit of San Diegans, and we're also setting the course nationwide. So just to quickly wrap up, I know that all of you, you have wonderful sessions, you have great tours ahead of you. I know that you're gonna be visiting, um, I kinda wanna hang out with you all these days. You're gonna be going to the International Airport, the San Diego Zoo, SeaWorld, Petco Park, uh, the Del Mar Fairgrounds. Thank you to all of the um, facilities for hosting the tours. So I know that as you visit all of those and, and talk to each other among these days, you're really going to have a better understanding of the great things we're doing here in San Diego. So thank you again, CRA, for organizing this. Thank you all who participated in the CRA Gives Back event yesterday in partnership with I Love a Clean San Diego and H2O Patrol. I think that service is another example of how everybody comes together and collaborates. So again, on behalf of our mayor, Mayor Kevin Faulkner, we welcome you to San Diego and we thank you all for the efforts and partnership in addressing all of our mutual goals. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandra, that was wonderful. Our next speaker is Dr. Brema Apamberi. I had some time to chat with Dr. A last night, and we agreed that a follow-on meeting between the CRRA and himself was definitely in order. As we talked about that, he immediately and very graciously invited me to his home for dinner. I think that I would be foolish not to take him up on that. Dr. Brema Apemberi is a water sanitation and hygiene development expert. He is currently a senior director at the Center of International Water and Sustainability at the Desert Research Institute in Nevada. He was a senior advisor at the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation and a director of WASH, which stands for Water Sanitation and Hygiene, at World Vision. He received his Bachelor of Science from the University of Ghana his Master's of Science from Carleton University in Canada, and his PhD from UNR in Reno. Dr. Appenberry, if you could please come on up and tell us how it is. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, thank you for inviting me even though I'm in a different crowd, not a wrong crowd, but a different <laughs> crowd. But I was invited to share with you my life 
born in northern Ghana in a rural village. Uh, and then uh, not having enough water, walking to school, and then uh, sleeping sometimes without food, and then uh, being where I am now. I always hate to talk about myself, so, but I'll do that a little bit. And then I will talk about the global water crisis. And uh, at the end, I will try to draw a link between what I do and what CRA, CRRA does and see if there will be possible uh, collaborations. I will begin with uh, a little bit of statistics. And uh, so globally, the pop our population is now about 7 billion people and uh, 663 million of us on earth do not have basic drinking water. And another 2.4 billion lack access to improved sanitation. Uh, some people say this is a silent killer, you know, it's, it's a crisis in developing countries. Most of these people are in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 300 million of them in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have access to uh, safe drinking water. And uh, close to a billion people in India do not have access to basic sanitation. And when we talk about basic sanitation, it's not sewered sanitation that you go into your bathroom in America here, lock it, and then uh, you free yourself and then flush it. It's just an open pit, you know, they don't have it to, to, to use. So my story, uh, which I've already shared a little bit, is that I was born in northern Ghana, and uh, very close to the Sahel, those of you who know the Sahel, that's the Sahara Desert in, uh, in uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we had very little rain uh, during the rainy season, and uh, I grew up in a house with about 40 people or family members, my aunts and uh, siblings and uh, cousins. And uh, we were good headers. We had to take cows out every morning, you know, to graze before we went to school. I attended my primary school in the same village and then walking every day about three miles to school uh, without footwear. Anyway, this is not common of me, but a lot of people in uh, developing countries face the same you know, conditions that I face. And uh, in the dry season, uh, we spend a lot of our time fetching water and then also taking cows to uh, open reservoirs which were very far away from our homes. The dry season, we also had a big problem because that's the time that all the grains that were harvested is all consumed and uh, we went uh, without food. Uh, there was no electricity, there was no TV, and uh, we did our home assignments under kerosene lamps, which are not very uh, healthy lamps for uh, people to use. Uh, but luck was on my side and determination. I was able to go to high school about 50 miles away from my village. And uh, you went there with the little food that your parents could give you and stayed in that, school, that high school for about two to three months and went on vacation. And then you came back again three times a year. I was talking with somebody earlier on who said he did Peace Corps in Kenya, and uh, I hold Peace Corps in high esteem because in high school, I was taught math and science by Peace Corps volunteers. Maybe from what we called in Ghana at the time, O and A level, which is, you know, senior uh, secondary school, uh, it's about seven years you spend there before you go to the university. And then I, I was taught by about 20 Peace Corps volunteers. At the time, we did not have math and science teachers. And Peace Corps volunteers were the ones who taught us and contributed to where I am today. So 
I raise my heart for America for that. And uh, I was successful in going to the university in Ghana. And uh, my hope was to be a medical doctor. Unfortunately, my applications got messed up, so I did not get to go to do medicine. And I, I started with geology as my first degree at the University of Ghana, you know, traveling from the north in the village now to live in the capital city, Accra. That was so overwhelming, but I continued to uh, study. And the following year, I got admission to go back to do medicine, but I was so happy with the course that I was taking and also got to learn that I can be a preventive doctor by helping to provide clean water and sanitation facilities to the poorest of the poor. So I continue with that, and after my BS, I got to work with World Vision in Ghana, drilling wells and constructing sanitation systems in poorest communities in the country. One of the things that I was involved in was to help eradicate guinea worm. How many people know guinea worm here? Okay, just a few people. It's a dilapidating disease. It's a worm, you know, you drink the larvae from water and then it hatches within your system. And then the worm comes out of your extremities, like your ankles and your, your feet. And it can put somebody down for eight months without, you know, mobility. So in Ghana, at a particular place, was a high incidence of guinea worm. And the project that I worked in as a hydrologist, you know, we helped to solve that. And within uh, five years, the guinea worm was eradicated. And <laughs> so in Ghana, I was involved with probably the site and construction of about 1,000 water and sanitation systems. And uh, relieving women you know, of going long distances to fetch water, having girls stay at school. You know, the impact is very enormous you know, when you are able to provide uh, basic drinking water and sanitation, especially for uh, women and girls. Uh, from my work with World Vision in Ghana, I had the opportunity to go to Canada to do my master's, which was a joint program at Carleton University and then uh, uh, Ottawa University, which are both in the capital. So I got my master's there and then uh, started my PhD and transferred to the University of Nevada, Reno uh, to do my PhD in hydrology. After that, I went back to World Vision in Seattle, headed up the global program there in over 100 countries, and uh, a lot of staff, you know, continuing the work that I did. And uh, after eight years there, I joined the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation in Los Angeles, and headed up the water program there for four years. And I'm now at the Desert Research Institute and the University of Nevada, Reno, where I got my PhD and established a center there, which I will, I will talk about. The reason why I like to talk about it this way is that water really impacted my life and, you know, helped me to be where I am today. And uh, I enjoy to, you know, speak with people like you who are int maybe interested in international development of how you can you can you can help out so that's my story let's go to a little bit into water again so 88 percent of disease burden in developing countries is due to lack of water sanitation and hygiene and uh, i want to pause here and just highlight what we call wash wash is water sanitation and hygiene and uh, we do these three things together because it improves life. You get the maximum health benefit when you provide people with water, provide them with sanitation facilities, 
And hygiene is the orphan component, which is also very important because people tend not to pay attention to that. But in rural communities, if you provide water and sanitation facilities and you don't help them learn the link between uh, disease and contaminated water, the right use of those facilities, that will lead to behavior change. Disease burden is not reduced. And that's why we always have the last component, uh, which is hygiene promotion. Uh, lack of clean water costs of Saharan Africa about 4.3% of its annual gross domestic product uh, of the entire uh, continent. And climate change is amplifying this. I was happy that uh, the president uh, was very frank about climate change and how U.S. is taking policies. I'm involved with some of those uh, conversations globally. And uh, when I was invited to speak here, I didn't know your stand, but you know, reading and knowing what you do, I am brave to talk about climate change because it's not every meeting that uh, you, you talk about climate change. You have to be brave in the USCA to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> so this makes me to be in the right group. <laughs> so according to the WHO, the wealth uh, the World Health Organization, about 1.4 million uh, children die from diarrhea, and about half a million people also die from malaria. And uh, malnutrition is a very big issue in developing countries, and this has its roots also in the lack of uh, uh, provision of safe drinking water and sanitation. Uh, collectively, in Africa, it's estimated that about 40 billion hours are lost by women fetching water. And this limits their education and uh, undermines gender equity. Water quality is a big problem also in developing countries, and I think this edges around what you do. Uh, poor groundwater quality and industrial waste affects, you know, groundwater quality. And more than half of the well cannot drink their local water supply without additional treatment. And climate change is exacerbating that. And I always use my own uh, experience growing up in Northern Ghana. We had about six months of rainfall when I was a child in Northern Ghana. And the rainfall pattern was almost evenly distributed in those six months. It just had a peak in August, but it, it evenly distributed. And, you know, we could grow our crops with the certainty that, you know, we'll have a good harvest. Now I go back to my own village, and the rainfall length is reduced to about three months. And uh, it comes very heavy, you know, it's very high, intense rainfall within a short period of time. And uh, the farmers or the peasant farmers in my area now have difficulty, you know, growing their crops because they pace these crops according to the six-month period that the rain used to fall. And now it doesn't happen that way. And it's so difficult to convince them that, oh, you have to grow other crops, you know, because maybe there are certain crops that can grow within a short period of time. And I have my friends, I travel with them, and they don't understand why, you know, the peasant farmers don't grow something else. But, you know, growing up there and knowing the culture, even the grains, the food that they eat is highly related with the culture. Because there are certain periods they have to harvest a certain crop and have certain formalities, you know. So it's very difficult, you know, as a result of that. And I have colleagues, myself, and graduate students who work on some of these issues in the climate change area, and the conditions are getting worse. So the path forward is to increase stakeholder resilience and water security, 
And uh, what I, I teach a lot in developing countries, and we try to you know, teach around climate change adaptations and resilience, and this is what we need, and improved watershed and water resource management you know, is a key area. And not just doing it at the scientific level, but how do you boil down this complex information which involves mathematical modeling so that you know, community members or users at the watershed level uh, will be able to use this information. I actually just traveled from Honduras direct to this uh, conference and teaching water professionals there on some of these issues. Uh, we need to improve water quality through post-construction support and then uh, increase the sustainability of wash systems. So the Desert Research Institute where I work, we are about 530, about 200 of us are PhDs in various fields. And uh, we run three divisions, the Division of Hydrologic Sciences, uh, the Division of Atmospheric Sciences, and then uh, the Division of Earth and Ecosystems. We have uh, campuses in Reno and also in Reno. About two-thirds of us are in Reno and a third in Las Vegas. We conduct research throughout uh, in the world, but uh, mostly in the arid you know, west of the United States. We do a lot of work in uh, uh, watershed management, environmental issues, and water quality work in Nevada, California, and then there's so many places in the U.S. So I, we have three divisions and four centers. One of the centers that I direct is the Center for International Water and Sustainability, which I helped to establish in 2013 uh, when I left the Hilton Foundation to go back to research and academia. Uh, we capitalize on the fact that we have a lot of scientists at DRI, environmental scientists, to develop programs that we can help you know, developing countries on their issues. So some of the objectives of the center are, you know, uh, multidisciplinary research, still around environment and climate change, uh, to address problems specific to developing countries, and then undertake capacity building, that's training, you know, training uh, water professionals, environmental professionals in developing countries uh, you, you know, most of you know that the capacity in developing countries to implement programs, monitor them, evaluate them, and sustain them in the long term, that capacity is lacking in most developing countries. And one thing about development is that you need to, you know, place responsibility in the hands of those who are doing it in their home countries. So one of the things DRI does is to make sure that we are transferring the, the skills, the knowledge uh, to the people in their home countries so that uh, they can manage their own affairs. Uh, we develop and disseminate information and also provide some services to uh, funders as well as non-governmental organizations. So just to highlight a few of the things that we do, our largest program is the Wash Capacity Building Program, which we've developed with the University of Nevada, Reno. And all D, most DRI faculty are also faculty at the University of Nevada, Reno. And I belong to uh, the College of Agriculture, uh, the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Science. So we've designed a program that is a, uh, a professional development program with several courses that we teach uh, some of it online. And then uh, we also go to a developing country and bring all our students to one location. And then we do the face-to-face -face teaching as well as conduct field work with them and then uh, lab work. This has proven to be a very, very good program. So far we've had about 50 students in this program. The advantage of this is that the students are full-time workers. They can work in their home countries. They don't need to come to the USCA. It's very expensive to come here even for a semester. Uh, so we, this program is ongoing and uh, it's, it's liked by a lot of people. The other uh, thing that we do is to develop relationships with universities in developing countries. 
And so far, we have about five partnerships with universities in Africa. And then we try to mentor professors, bring them to the U.S. We also travel there and, you know, develop joint programs. And then help them set up, you know, WASH centers or training programs. Because WASH, Water Sanitation and Hygiene, is a multidisciplinary program. It used to be engineering and science for those of us who have that background. But it has evolved to include social workers, health professionals. So it's such a large field that it's so difficult to go into one department and get all the requirements to be a, wa a WASH professional. So what we do is to help, you know, have a one-shop all, you know, program that WASH professionals can, you know, take. Uh, we have a program in Liberia. We help them uh, develop their water systems, especially in the post Ebola. We help to construct water systems in several uh, healthcare facilities. Uh, we currently are now helping the government of Liberia to set up baseline water quality data and uh, looking at how they can set up their water quality standards. And I have one of my master's students who is actually doing his thesis in Liberia, applying DNA sequencing on water quality issues in Liberia and trying to help the country. We're looking at algal bloom studies in Ghana, you know, in their large water systems where they've reported the occurrence of cyanotoxins and I have DRI colleagues uh, working on these issues in Ghana. So these are some of the partnerships that uh, I just described, which I would not want to go into detail. And uh, the Circuit Rider program was actually developed in the U.S. here when the Drinking Water Act was passed. And uh, it was realized that small uh, water facilities in the U.S. did not have uh, the capacity to repair and maintain their water system. So the U.S. government, through EPA, developed what they call the Circuit Rider Program to provide support to these small water utilities. Twenty years later, it was taken to Canada and then also in Latin America. And uh, DRI, we are now trying to implement it in developing countries because some of you might be aware that we've complained about the lack of water in developing countries, but once you provide it, there are certain times that within two to five years, the systems break down again because they are not able to repair and maintain them. And those community members go back to their traditional sources of drinking water. So this program, the Secure Rider program, is addressing that. And we currently have program, this program in Chile, in Honduras, in, in Ghana, and then we are expanding it to eight other countries. I talked about the Liberia program. I talked about the Ghana program. Uh, in Sierra Leone, we are helping the government to cl create hydrological monitoring uh, stations that they can monitor their, both their surface water and groundwater. And this data is collected, you know, in a a big program that is addressing climate change issues. And uh, so DRI is also working on that. We do a lot of uh, uh, water resource management, climate change work that I talked about using the resources that DRI has. We have excellent GIS capabilities, satellite imagery capabilities, hydrological modeling, climate change modeling. But sometimes this is done in academics to publish papers. But how do we you know, boil down this information so that the users in these watersheds are able to use the information to better their own lives. We look at applying these resources also in low-cost irrigation technologies to minimize water use uh, in developing countries. Uh, my last two points have to do with what you do, and I think uh, some of you have traveled internationally. Uh, the issue of Solid waste management is very, very big in developing countries, especially in urban centers like Nairobi, Accra. It's a very huge issue. And uh, we have the, advant uh, the disadvantage in developing countries because there are other issues that we are dealing with that are solved here. Basic drinking water, sanitation, housing, food. So they don't have, you know, this, this is low on their scale 
And uh, one of the things that we've started to do at DRI is exposing our students to solid waste management. So we take them to uh, waste uh, management sites and they look at the engineering of it and how they can advise on improving it, especially if the waste management is linked with economic, you know, production, agriculture, you know, biogas production, you know, they are more attracted to working on that. So we are exposing our students to this in different countries. My home country, Ghana, we are actually looking at a waste site dump in at the northern part of the country where I come from and looking at how we can help them generate biogas, composting, smallholder irrigation, and those kinds of things around you know, waste management. And I, I, to I talked with a few of you about maybe partnering with you about how we can you know, include this part of the work in what we do. And uh, I think I also talked with some of you about different organizations and uh, associations and all that. We work in silos, but we begin to talk and you realize that there's a lot that we can do together. And I think that uh, I'm a hydrologist by training and sometimes there is some war between you know, waste management people and hydrologists because we accuse you for polluting our water systems and all that. <laughs> But I think, you know, we can talk about how we can collaborate and, you know, help, uh, help each other. So e-waste, you know, is one big thing that is happening in developing country now. And I just heard you that saying that India, uh, China has refused to <laughs> receive your waste now. But we also have that in Africa where, especially in Europe, they send a lot of their waste to Africa without looking at how we can manage, manage them. So that's my end slide. This is in, uh, I think, Nigeria. And uh, you can see how chaotic it is. There's a lot of burning and uh, things are not processed at all. So in conclusion, clean water is integral to achievement of human development targets. Uh, water is essential for health and the planet. And safe water is a human right, which uh, I think there's a debate here in the US. Yeah. We do have time for a couple of questions, and we have some mic runners. So um, the first two get it. <laughs> I can't see. So if anyone has a question, stand up, please. Make your way to an aisle. Oh, I see you. Good morning. There are. Uh, projections that as global warming worsens over the next century, we're gonna see millions, maybe billions of water refugees in heavily water stressed countries such as the Sahel in Africa, places like Pakistan, Bangladesh in, in Asia and other parts of the world, maybe even Arizona and Nevada in the US. Are these issues that your institute looks at and is there anything that you can offer to help us plan ahead for that situation? Yeah, our institute, uh, you know, there are a lot of climate change models. And uh, so our institute actually works on those models to refine them. And then uh, we have projects that we try to project this in Africa and what the consequences will be uh, in terms of water supplies. But you are right, you know, it's projected that water will become scarce, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. So I talked about climate change adaptation and resilience, and that is what DRI works on. You know, so if we are designing water systems, how do we ensure that you know, groundwater is recharged, is used efficiently, and the structures that you are building, how can you adapt them to climate change? How can they be resilient to climate change? But we've just begun to work on this in Africa, given that that will be the place that will suffer the most uh, in developing countries. So we have a, a very big group at DRI that works on this, you know, coupling 
hydrological modeling with climate change modeling. But I think part of the solution is, and I, I know that this group doesn't think that way, is to see how we can minimize it, prevent it, and that's why we have all these climate uh, change talks and uh, US, ba U.S. backed out of it and we've lost that leadership now. But uh, I think we need to work collectively to see how we address it. Um, as a water quality professional, uh, you focused much on developing countries, but I thought you might want to use this opportunity to comment about our use of historical groundwater below Southern California and uh, the water balance of having those aquifers continue to deplete and there's not a lot of conversation about treating recharge. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I think parts of California are doing a lot of recharge in Santa Ana, I know. But uh, California, and I have to be careful about this, California <laughs> has used a lot of water. And, uh, <laughs> but we are, we are lucky in the last year, too, we've had a lot, of, a lot of rain or precipitation in general, so the water is bouncing back. But I, I think uh, California, and I usually, uh, well, I talk about international, but my graduate work was in Reno, and I, we studied a lot of water issues in California and Nevada. And if you look at the Southern Nevada District Water Authority, the way they manage their water system in terms of efficiency, California never did that. But I think there's an awakening call now that you have to be very efficient and I don't want to mention Jerry Brown, but I think he is working hard at that with various counties and all that to try to, to address that. I think it's efficiency, uh, recharge, artificial recharge, you know, because the little rain that California gets, you need to direct this into, into the ground. And uh, that's the only way that, you know, uh, the water uh, can be solved here. I always compare the amount of water that is used elsewhere, even in Europe, you know, in developing countries compared to America, and it's just mind-boggling that uh, one person uses about 150 gallons of water a day, you know, when it's a finite resource. So I think there's a lot of awareness now uh, being created about how efficient, you know, water can be used and how recharge, you know, can be done. And I think what you are doing now in terms of influencing policy, awareness creation, is the same thing that is done within the water community in California to, to address the issue. But it's a big issue here in, uh, in California. We've been lucky, you know, last year and this year we've had a lot of precipitation, especially in the Sierra Nevada mountains, and it's been a lot of water now, but we need to manage it uh, properly. Uh, we have one more question. Yeah, uh, it's Captain Charles Moore. I just returned from uh, Chile, uh, voyage uh, studying uh, the issues. Uh, um, basically, my focus is plastic pollution, so we looked at the uh, Great Pacific Garbage Patch off of Chile. But in, in uh, sailing through the Atacama Desert, uh, I worked with people working on the desalinization, and I was wondering if you could evaluate uh, and compare uh, alternative energy power desalinization with wind and solar versus precipitation from the atmosphere, these new technologies that can take and remove the uh, humidity from the atmosphere as an adjunct to uh, creating fresh water. Yeah, desalinization is the uses, you know, membrane filtration technologies and reverse osmosis and all that. And that's the ultimate water treatment technology because it treats water at the molecular level. But you know that it's very expensive in terms of the membranes and you mentioned the energy, you know, and the economics of scale of it in, I don't know whether you asked of it in context of developing countries, but in developing countries, it's very expensive technology, you know, so is being introduced but not as fast, you know, in terms of uh, because of the cost of it. But as technology improves and membranes decrease in, you know, uh, cost, 
I think it will be a very good uh, uh, technology to use in you know providing water, and it's the same as the solar the solar sector. You know, ten years ago, solar panels were very very expensive, and uh, when we worked with solar, it was difficult to deploy them in many areas, even though they are still relatively expensive. But I think the Chinese market has brought solar down, and this is not affordable in developing countries. And uh, so as technology improves, this is a technology that we need to work on. You also talked about, you know, systems that, you know, extract humidity from the atmosphere. And that also depends on the temperature, the relative humidity in those areas. They work, but if the conditions are not right for it, you know, they don't, they don't work per se. I think in developed countries where resources are there, uh, th these technologies may be used. But the work that I do, they tend to be very expensive for now, you know, to extract humidity uh, from the atmosphere and have water for people to drink. Okay, one more question here. Do we have time? <coughs> Hi, Gary Liss. Uh, one of the key connections between the water issues and zero waste is composting. Um, what can, from your experience and research, what can be done uh, to encourage and uh, make sure that the agricultural industry recognizes how important compost can be to retain water efficiency? Uh, I, I think it's, some of it boils down to the fact that we work in these silos and we tend not to talk about how we can take comparative advantage of our different sectors to work on some of these issues. And I kind of touch on this a little bit about how I come from the water sector, but how I'm now trying to have our students talking with Minister of Agriculture, talking with the Energy Ministry, because all these are interrelated. So my, I think my uh, advice around this is the bringing ag the Agriculture Ministry in developing countries, the Energy Ministry, about how we can do this together. Yeah. I have students who work on composting, biogas, but they are hydrology students. And the moment they begin to do that, then I think we'll get into solving the problem. I go back to my home country. I'm talking with the Minister of Energy. I'm talking with the Minister of Agriculture. But uh, most of the time, we are silos. Yeah. So very much, Dr. Appenberry. As Americans, we take something like clean water for granted. We open the tap and it comes out. I can't even imagine what it must be like to have to worry about where my next clean drink of water is coming from. So the work that Dr. Appenberry is doing is very well linked with the work that we are doing at the CRRA and in the industry in general. I do have one very quick and important housekeeping item. Sometime before tomorrow, I need you all to look behind your name badge and make sure you have a meal ticket for the lunch. No meal ticket, we can't feed you. We'll find a way, but it's a lot easier if you have a meal ticket. So <laughs> please just take a moment and check that sometime in the next 24 hours. I also found it very entertaining and clever that uh, Dr. Appenberry's two initiatives are called wash and dry. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's just me, but. I, I challenge him to make his next two fluff and fold. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> Before I introduce our next speaker, I do want to introduce and thank a very important person without whom this conference would not go off. Espina Kriatschulis. <laughs> Please stand up and the fact that you are all here and sitting in your chairs and you have a badge and a meal ticket and a room and places to go and people to see and things to listen to and things to talk about, that's all Vespina and her hardworking staff. She makes it look easy and it's not. So when you see her walking purposefully through the hallways over the next couple of days, please smile at her and say thank you. She works extremely hard. How many of you are here at this conference for the very first time? Can I see a show of hands? Wow, that's a lot of us. That's awesome. 
I'm assuming then the rest of you are repeat offenders. Yeah. We love you. Thank you very much. Our final speaker for today is Jared Blumenfeld. Jared has spent the last two decades fighting to create tangible benefits for communities and ecosystems alike. He's been at the forefront of the zero waste global movement and believes that recycling is one of the most important actions we can take to reduce greenhouse gas. He's trained as an international environmental lawyer at UC Berkeley. He's working for the National, Re working for the National Resource Defense Council. Jared started his career by tracking the promises made in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit. He went on to lead a coalition of fishermen, Mexican grassroots organizations, and international NGOs in an epic five-year battle to protect the gray whale's birthing grounds in the Baja. That victory was described by Cox News as the most significant environmental victory of our generation. He was appointed by San Francisco, yes, please. He was appointed by San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown Jr. in 2001 to run one of the nation's first city departments focused on the environment. He helped transform San Francisco into the greenest city in America by focusing on what the municipality could do to reduce carbon emissions. He worked with communities and businesses alike to establish the city's zero waste by 2020 goal. From 2009 to 2016, Mr. Blumenfeld worked as the EPA Regional Administrator for the Pacific Southwest under President Barack Obama. It feels so good to say those words. <laughs> I wish I was still saying them on a regular basis. During his tenure at the EPA, Jared focused on climate change, recycling, tribes, environmental justice enforcement, and drinking water. He established an enforcement division and settled a multi-billion dollar pollution cases on the regular. He's a trusted source for environmental stories and has appeared frequently in the New York Times, BBC, Economist, San Francisco Chronicle, CNN, Los Angeles Times, NPR, and other media outlets. He lives in San Francisco, and I am pleased to welcome him to the stage. Thanks, Jenna. So, so yeah, I, I was very worried when I phoned to Spina. I was like, am I going to be speaking right when the eclipse happens? <laughs> so no, you've got a little bit of time to go outside and see the cloud cover get, you know, gradually darker. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing, if you look at your little book, it says um, zero waste, storm water, and well-being. So I'm going to do it in the reverse order. So I'm going to start um, by talking about, is that moving? Okay. So the last time I was in San Diego was here. Um, we already have a wall um, that, you know, some people, I guess, don't recognize that. The wall um, is pretty cool. So the wall between the U.S. and Mexico, um, those numbers represent um, the aircraft carrier landing strips from World War II that were then disassembled and made into the wall between the U.S. and Mexico. I kind of had enough with being a bureaucrat. Um, I, I'm not really sure how I became a bureaucrat, but I realized at some point it was kind of killing me inside of like, I'm, I'm not sure I can keep doing this. So I quit my job and decided to hike um, from Mexico to Canada, which, you know, is the normal response to thinking you've... <laughs> my wife was like, couldn't you do like a two-week hike or... So uh, four and a half months later, I ended up um, in Canada. Let's see, does this work? Okay. So um, I came to lots of different realizations. Um, when you spend every single night outside, um, you realize a lot of things. One of them, um, if you think about all the different creation myths that Christianity, Judaism, Islam all have, they're all kind of dated. And I suddenly looked up at the stars, this is my tent, and realized that we were created from this incredible, it, doesn't, it sounds like a myth, but there was this huge explosion 14 billion years ago from an infinitely dense atom that just scattered into a universe that's ever expanding and increasing, and we're a teeny, teeny speck in that. So what you realize is that we are made of stardust, and everything shares that same beginning. So we are equal to the trees, the rocks, to each other, 
Um, and that really, you kind of feel that really pretty powerfully when you're out there. Um, and that, that kind of helped recenter me and think about some of the issues that I'm going to talk about. Um, I still have Dr. Appenberry's slides looking at me, so um, I'm just clicking through, so they're, they're appearing somewhere. So, um, <laughs> and they just keep going. Uh, these are my kids um, um, at the Boy Scout tree up in Jedediah Smith um, Park. Since this is CRRA, I figure it's all of California. I spent 1,600 miles walking the length of California. Um, by the time you get to the Oregon border, you're like, thank God, oh my God, I want to get the hell out of California. It's so, <laughs> so big, so long. Um, so yeah, I was really, really grateful to, um, to get out. Um, so what you realize also is in waste, as with, um, I was talking to Heidi last night at dinner, bananas and the rest of nature, there is no waste, right? Wherever you go, there really, there's absolutely no waste in nature. And wherever you see that, the trees decompose, the ants take them away, it turns back into soil, turns back into a tree. So we have created waste. Waste is a human design flaw, right? We have created this problem, and now we're desperately trying to work out how to solve it. Uh, nature has already solved it. We're just trying to play catch up and not doing a very we're doing a really bad job of it. So waste is a design flaw. Getting back to zero waste is really just getting back to where we started. Um, this is the Tuolumne River. Um, it's the water supply for much of the Bay Area, but a lot of it's pumped on the aqueduct up to Hatchapies and back down. Um, doesn't really make it all the way to San Diego, but it does bring in you know, the, the issue of water, and Dr. Appengary kind of spoke to this. Um, these are just going by themselves, so I guess this is telling me I need to go faster. Um, <laughs> so when you, when you go backwards, I'm going to try and go backwards. Nope. Yeah, there we go. Nice. <laughs> I am forcing it backwards. So um, when you see the difference between these two, uh, the headwaters of the Tuolumne, is pristine water from snowmelt um, in the Sierra Nevada. This is the, the next, is the Los Angeles River. Um, and the Clean Water Act, if you think about these incredible statutes that many of which were signed by President Nixon, um, we did not exist in that era politically where the environment was divided between a Republican and Democrat. And we cannot stay there. We, we cannot stay there. So. Um, sure it's really got a life of its own. Okay, well, pretend we're on the LA River slide. Um, the LA River slide, uh, there we go, cool. So the LA River um, was significant because under the Clean Water Act, um, impaired waters for sediment, temperature, all these different issues had never been impaired for trash. So this was the beginning of a story. So back in like 1996, LA said our river and the LA River here goes into Long Beach, which goes into the Pacific Ocean, our river is impaired for trash. And it was incredibly radical. And it really is the intersection that this conference is studying. No one had done that before. And the Water Board and others, cool. This is great. And is there any way that we can get what the next slide is on here? So that would be cool, too. Um, so the LA. This was like massively radical, and EPA didn't know what to do when it got it, and the state didn't know what to do, but eventually it said, yes, trash is a legitimate impairment. And once you declare something an impairment, then you need to come out with this diet called total maximum daily load. So TMDL is the diet that you have to say, we are gonna put this water body on a diet. We're gonna stop whatever it is. This uh, sediment, these toxic materials, or in this case, trash going into the river. And then you need to have a timetable. How are we going to do this? So once LA did it, um, it led to next. Um, so this just, by the way, is right down the street. This is the Tijuana River estuary. So the Tijuana estuary comes from Tijuana into the US. Most people think that because we're such a big, powerful country, all the rivers must go 
from north to south, but they actually go the other way. Um, and this was the last, um, I say that word with some seriousness, the last EPA administrator. Um, there may never be another one. Um, she, uh, Gina, came down to look at it with Serge Dedina. Serge um, is the executive director of Wild Coast, um, but he's also now the mayor of Imperial Beach and really looking at these issues of um, how we deal with plastic. So the Tijuana River Estuary in San Diego got very involved at looking at impairments as trash. Um, next. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to Midway Island. Um, uh, we have with us the person who actually discovered the Pacific Garbage Patch um, is from San Diego, uh, Captain Charles Moore. Charles, can you stand up? Yeah. Long Beach, sorry, the Algelita, his... Welcome, thank you, thank you. So um, this was just a week of marine debris that washed up on Midway. Ghost nets, um, fishing gear, and the Lusane albatross are there, and they, there's about a million and a half of them that nest um, there. And you've seen the hideous pictures. I'm not going to um, shock you too early in the morning with more pictures of marine debris, and you'll see, see them as the, the conference progresses. Um, I love this slide, kind of, where does all this come from, <laughs> and how can we find it? Um, so basically, I went down, and, and there's some EPA staff here in the room. I'm not going to name them because they'll embarrass them. But let's give them a round of applause because <laughs> they um, they're doing a really, really good job um, in very, very difficult circumstances. We all like read the paper and groan. They go to work and have to groan. Um, <laughs> So at EPA, we basically came together as a team, um, and we heard a minute ago about these silos. We all exist in silos. We love to be in silos because we want to be focused and specialized and get our job done. But when you lift your head up, um, what you realize is that marine debris, there's basically three ways of looking at it. One is upstream. How do you redesign things so they don't become waste at all? Um, how do you stop it? from going into the ocean? And then thirdly, and most difficultly, how do you clean it up once it's in the ocean? So um, the National Geographic had a recent article on the 8.6 billion tons of plastic that have been created in our lifetimes during you know, the last 50 years. And of that, only 9% has been recycled. So 9% recycling rate for all the plastic ever created. Um, that's not great. Um, OK. So we, create, we continue to create um, more and more stuff. Um, we like stuff, right? That's part of our problem. So one of the solutions would be just make less crap that we don't need. But that doesn't seem like something that we're ever going to get to. Um, so instead, we make more crap that we don't need. Um, and these are my particular least favorite thing. Like, couldn't you just ground the coffee and put it in the, yeah. Um, but I guess that's proving difficult for people. So um, in LA, I asked the LA County, what was the single most efficient thing that you did to stop trash going in to the LA River? And it was replacing these. So just getting a cart with a lid in unincorporated parts of the county. They were like, that was by far. So when people talk about the Pacific Garbage Patch, they think of all these complex solutions, just getting rid of these in many coastal communities. Because when it's windy, this blows around, and eventually it, it ends up um, leading to this. So eventually just keeps going, goes into the street, turns into litter. So just replacing them. You're all in that business, and you that you probably don't think just getting single stream carts with a lid would help, but it does. And there's many parts of our state that still do not have this system. Many parts. Um, so the next thing is it goes down storm drains, and it gets into smaller and smaller pieces of litter. I took this picture um, in LA, um, and these drains are actually designed to have the plastic go in. But often you think of, oh, the plastic breaks down into teeny, teeny pieces before it goes into the ocean. That's actually a, a big problem, because the smaller the pieces are, 
um, the harder it is to get. I, I thought that only happened in the ocean itself, but it happens before it even gets in. Um, LA and San Diego, when you drive around, you will see this is a really cool invention. Basically, at the storm drain level, they have these little rubber flaps, and so um, all the trash doesn't go into them, and when they have street cleaning, they get to pull that up rather than it going down the storm drain. It's really pretty inexpensive, but they put it on 10,000 storm drains um, in LA in the matter of years. So very low-tech solutions that really help that I'd never heard of. I didn't know that this was happening. So LA, San Diego are actually global leaders, global leaders. No one else, this is not happening in Shanghai. This is not happening in Jakarta. This is not happening in Melbourne nowhere else in the Pacific. So these are very simple things that people can do to stop trash. Um, this is our business, CRRA, is in the recycling, reuse, resource recovery business. We don't necessarily think of street sweeping, but street sweeping is really, really important for many different air contaminants um, and other issues. If you can get HEPA filter street filters, uh, street sweepers, for instance, Lake Tahoe Clarity, um, the Desert Research Institute spends a lot of time on Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe clarity is because of um, very, very fine particles that go into the atmosphere and then are deposited into the lake that are leading to that lack of clarity. The solution is street sweeping. So bizarre things that are in our wheelhouse um, in resource recovery are actually helping water and clean water. So here's a solution in Oakland they come out and they have this very cool vacuum. They put that silver thing into it and they skim all the trash off the surface and then they recover that. Um, there is a trash policy, much as 1383 sent shivers throughout the room. I, when people talk about that, I know local governments got trepidation about that. Um, the trash policy that the state water board passed has a goal of getting to zero trash in water bodies by 2026, zero trash. So we have a zero waste goal in the state, 2026 um, is just around the corner and really, really incumbent on local government to help get there. And I know many people in the room are from local government. You're feeling like more and more is on your plate. This is an area where you need to sit down with your public utilities commission or your water division and say, how are we gonna do this together? Because it's impossible for either of you to do it individually. So another thing that just globally, if you were thinking about what you could do um, in anywhere around the world, I am stunned how many landfills are within one kilometer of the ocean. And so if you build a landfill within one kilometer of the ocean and then you have sea level rise, it's going to exacerbate the problem of the Pacific garbage patch. Um, so all that waste that we thought was stored forever is going to be eroded. I was in Taiwan, and you could already see them being eroded significantly. I mean, trash was coming out of them every single day. Um, they have a very, very proud tradition in Taiwan of, of getting to zero waste. Um, and I was like, but all your waste is going into the ocean. They were like, yeah, no, that's a problem. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, think about, I, I hate cigarette butts, um, and street art, cool things that you can do in your communities to bring attention. Um, we're kind of segueing into a, has recycling been eclipsed part of the discussion. City Hall, um, I agree, we we're having a discussion last night. It should start where it can, at City Hall, not in Sacramento. The more you can do in your local communities first to understand what it is that you need to do to best adapt to these issues, especially as they relate to stormwater, you're going to get a much more tailored, um, better fit if you come up with it first rather than just having it come from Sacramento. In some cases, you're going to have to have state legislation and the state is leading and I think that's a really fantastic place for them to be. Um, banning plastic bags is a great thing for stormwater. Um, when we in San Francisco um, took on that ban, the Nexus study we did, the most amount of cost was cleaning plastic bags out of storm drains. That's where when you look at that Nexus study of why are plastic bags such a nuisance, it's because they cause such a pain 
to water systems. Um, the same is true with styrofoam. Um, styrofoam never goes away in the environment. Um, Captain Moore can tell you, you know, you can, you can find pieces of styrofoam from the 60s still floating around out there in ever smaller little pieces. So the China ban means we're going to have more recycled material here, which means we need to buy things made out of recycled materials. So that seems like, yeah, um, a radical thing to say. Um, yeah, Zoe's here, and Zoe and I went on um, with Timony like a, a four-year odyssey to try and get the federal government to buy 100% recycled copy paper. Um, and this was under the Obama administration, and we spent hours and months and years on it, and it was an epic failure. Because um, people are like, why would we want to buy, does that, do we really need 100%? We're like, yeah, you, you really do. <laughs> um, the best thing, just some levity, we were told that there was a much better thing to use the recycled, recycled pulp for than recycled paper, which is toilet paper. And we were like, toilet paper? I mean, that, doesn't, that has a pretty short life cycle, doesn't it? <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, it is difficult. Um, if your county or city um, or company isn't using recycled products, this is obviously one of them, um, we need to have something for all these products to go into, and we need to make sure they are given a much higher preference when we're going out to bid. Um, this is a cool product in terms of redesign. Um, it is made out of ocean plastic, so um, it method basically pays small communities around the Pacific to collect plastic, which they then buy, which they then turn into this product, which they market to people who understand the problem and say it's made out of ocean plastic. Um, obviously, our collective goal in this room is to make sure there isn't any plastic for them to make this bottle out of, but to the extent there still is, it's a good thing to make. Um, so as we think about redesign, um, I particularly hate Capri Sun. Um, <laughs> but um, while there may be clapping in some part of the room, if this meeting was on climate change and waste management, people would say, this is the way to go. Go this way because you can, you know, that light weighting makes it easier to ship and therefore the greenhouse gases and transportation are significantly less than any other way that you could package it. But if you care about stormwater and the world's oceans, you would never want them to make this at all. So as we think about reformulating packaging, you can't just think about climate change. You can't just think about toxins like BPA and phthalates you also need to think about the world's oceans. And for some reason, when these discussions are happening, this is always the last one. So I want to encourage everyone in the room to think about how we can bump it up the list a little bit. Yeah. Um, another thing is, just back to my uh, rant about not buying as much crap that we don't need, like repairing stuff. I love this like self-repair manifesto, and I have a bicycle. When our bicycles break, we don't throw them away. We get them fixed. <laughs> so thinking about little things that we can all do in our communities and with legislation. In France, they just passed a um, tax break if you repair things. So how do we, yeah, cool stuff that you can do. Um, this guy, um, um, Boyan Slat, is a young dude who's come up with a potential solution, it doesn't seem to be working incredibly well, but he's getting a lot of money um, to clean up the Pacific garbage patch in five years to at 50% of it. So if this works, fantastic, but a lot of media attention gets focused on, well, they're just gonna clean it up. So does it really matter that it goes into the storm drains and into our rivers, on our beaches? Literally, this is the conversation that people are having. Why would we invest in you when we could just do one quick fix at the end, right? Um, so explaining to people that redesign um, and preventing it from going down the storm drains to begin with is a good thing, is harder, bizarrely, even though this is a really great thing, we want it to happen, um, we need to do all of the above. So to me, this is a really hard time um, to be in our world, which is we care about California, we care about our communities, um, 
we're passionate about the environment and recycling. I love recycling. That's why I, I agreed to come and speak. I was like, I'm on my sabbatical year. I don't want to speak. But when John Dunn phoned me like 10 minutes after I finished the trail, I was like, yeah, I'll do it. I love recycling. <laughs> Um, the reason we all care um, also makes it really difficult when people don't care. Um, and so we th collectively in this room are that beacon of light that people are looking to. Wherever I go, people say, you know what, California is going to keep the light burning. California is going to show us the way. And so as down as you may be, everyone is looking at you to inspire them. So keep your spirits up as much as you can. Um, Jack Macy somewhere, I couldn't um, do a presentation without stealing one of Jack's slides. Um, so w climate change, in terms of b being eclipsed, the kind of provocative title, the reason I think we are being eclipsed is climate change is a very, very abstract notion to most people. That is why it is failing as a motivator of action. No one sees directly climate change. Everyone understands recycling. Everyone understands solar panels. Everyone understands bicycling rather than driving their Hummer to work. So w by abstracting this concept to such a level that it doesn't mean anything to anyone, we're basically giving in and losing the arguments. Um, and so for me, the, the issue about the, what, you know, the, the iceberg concept is really that, you know, that waste berg, so to speak, means that most of the waste that you see is just the teeny bit above the surface, but all, everything that goes into making those products, um, we just spent time talking about the stormwater and ocean impacts, but getting people back to really understanding the amount of energy it takes to make a product. Um, this is a mine in Arizona. Um, it now takes about four tons to get one ounce of iron ore. This is a, a copper um, uh, mine in Arizona. So the, the, that truck that you can see at the bottom is higher than the ceiling in here. So the destructive impacts on wildlife, on biodiversity, on, on this particular case, on drinking water are huge. Every time you don't recycle that product, um, the toxic waste impacts um, that are left after manufacturing I got great pictures because I got to go to all the most hideous places in the West. Um, and the benefits, we, you know, Gary kind of pointed to that, just the water retention benefits of applying compost to rangeland and seeing that systemic shift in the soil and its ability to capture carbon. So if you think about carbon sinks, the atmosphere is a carbon sink. It is completely full. We cannot use it anymore. The ocean is absolutely full with carbon and ocean acidification um, is probably the first and most deadly impact of climate change that we'll all see in our generation. During like six weeks after Trump was elected, there was a headline in the New York Times that no one seemed to notice, which is, I don't know if it was ultimately true or not, but the Great Barrier Reef is dead. Meanwhile, Trump, you know, is blah, blah. I was like, what? The great, th that can't just get past that quickly. This reef that I have not shown my kids, that I've never seen myself, the greatest you know, living organism on the planet is dead because of ocean warming and acidification and all the things that are you know, fighting against it. So the ocean has no more room as a carbon sink. This is the last place we can put carbon, which is the soil. And there's a huge capacity to do that. And really the sea state change that is needed is by putting compost on it. Um, so the State Department of Ag just put out um, RFPs for multi-million dollar proposals to look at applying it to rangeland. So that's the other relationship is how do we get compost to communities that want it in rural California? Um, and the single biggest divide that I see in California is not between north and south, it's between urban and rural. When you travel the state um, and I did it very slowly, but I met lots and lots and lots of wonderful people that uh, put me up for the night in their houses, did my washing, because you have to go back and forth from the trail to get your food every week. And they all voted for Trump, and they were the sweetest, nicest people that I've ever met. 
So it's not like people who voted for Trump are evil. They don't care about the environment. They're really sweet, nice people that feel very differently about the same state that we live in. Um, so understanding that we, uh, we aren't as polarized on many issues as we think we are. And that really the environment is one of those things. Back to the original night looking at the stars, we're kind of signing a suicide pact if we don't solve these problems because we live on this planet. This is not like some philosophical argument. This is a very, very scientifically grounded argument that this is what we need to sustain life on this planet and we are causing irreparable harm to those systems. So to me, this is a survival of the planet and us as a species, that's what's at stake. So this is important. I'm not gonna talk about the CRV other than to say um, I wrote an op-ed on it. Um, you guys care about the fact that many of the redemption centers, um, like we all want redemption, don't we? And so like, <laughs> why would we, why would we want to close down a center where you could get redemption? Um, I don't know, like to me, yeah, thank you. Um, what it speaks to is the need for you as an organization, CRRA, and Jenna's just three weeks in, but Jenna, I'm gonna pitch this to you as well. Um, you need to get more politically active. Um, and, and the reason you need to be more politically active is you have something really important to say and to express, and you are, when you think about the, the Paris Agreement, right, it's really sad that the president didn't sign it. But those international agreements are only as good as what happens on the ground to implement them. And you are a large part of that implementation and that is happening anyway. So when people talk about caring about climate change, you are the boots on the ground that are getting that job done, as well as the solar and other industries. But when the solar industry goes to PG&E or the State Public Utilities Commission, they are listened to. They, they, people understand the number of jobs that come with them. People understand the amount of money and the importance on the economy. I don't think that's true of recycling. Recycling is kind of like, eh, yeah, that was cool. That, that happened in the 70s, the three R's, I remember that. It isn't treated with the respect that I think it deserves as an issue. It's, it's kind of put off as we've done that. We have not done that. And you all know those challenges. So we really need as a community to step up to the plate and say, listen, we're a huge, an important industry that hires green collar workers, that hires people at all different spectrums, that is making a big difference, that if you don't listen to us, things are gonna go very wrong. And they're going very wrong because Cal Recycle is now sending bills out to mom and pop shops about you know that they owe thousands of dollars a month. And that's not a good place to be. People don't like that. And this could have been avoided if CRRA had been listened to more. So. That really requires you to think of yourselves slightly differently. This isn't just an association where you meet and share best practices and learn from each other. This is a time where your voice needs to be heard. The rest of the nation is looking um, and I think you can do it. Thank you.